Hi, this is uh, a part of the MSX Omega series that has been long time coming and we haven't spoken about the, the schematics yet, we haven't gone into detail about the functionality and stuff but now when we are entering a phase where we need to do some, some fault findi finding, we actually started with that in the last episode but it's time to do some details of the schematics and I also got some tips one I read off the internet and one I got from the maker of this project himself, Sergey, that um, has left a comment and actually stated some things that I should have noticed and there is also some other things that probably can cause this but I'm not sure until we get to try out some more what's actually happening in this circuit. And first off, I read this of the internet, that with certain 8255s, they get the error memory not found message from CBIOS. And that's a very close resemblance to my error, but I actually got no more 82C55s. I only have the, the not CMOS version and they are quite the power hungry beast, so I'm not sure if that is applicable. Can I use that? I don't think so, at least not with the HGT logic as glue logic around this. So I have to wait till I get some more 8255s and I, I have ordered some now from um, the Far East. So let's hope they show up in the mail. And this from um, Sergei himself, it says that the HC and in the parenthesis 670s can be the culprit. And I do have some more HC. 670s and I also got the 74 LS I think so I do think I can replace these and check if they are good I don't have any tester that reads this at the moment I need to upgrade the firmware of my um, ship tester pro before I can test this in any good means and he also pointed out some of the other glue logic ICs that can be bad we will go into and, and look into, I, I have actually marked these in the schematic so we can take them as we go along. And you also noticed that the general thesis that I can't connect LS outputs to HC inputs. That's generally not a good idea and that really depends on how good the timings and how the triggering between the circuits go. But I had problems with this in the past and I actually do have uh, one or two places where this happens in these schematics, so we will look into that. And this is the first page of the schematics, and this is just to mention all the objects that's presented later in the schematics. Here we even put the holes that needs to be drilled in the main board, and this is just to tie things together. They do have some things that I don't understand and that might be because back in the day I was not used to this object kind of formatted schematics but we do have the power flag here that is a label that goes everywhere. I don't know if it's just to flag that this is, is power or if this actually means anything. Because this is connected to a lot of places in the schematics and even here on the ground plane they have the power flag. So if this is just to flag this as a part of the power supply, I'm not sure, but it probably is. This is the video processor part of the schematics and we do have the video processor here and we do have the memory chips here and this is the 41464s that we do know from the 64 schematics and we also on this page have the video mixer output for making RGB and other uh, video signals as the S video output and this is not the most critical at least if we go by Sergei's mention of parts but we do have this and this is the 74 HCT32 that uh, Sergei mentioned here but actually in the schematics this is stated as um, AHCT and that is quite the difference because 
if we look into the data sheet so this this is just a small snippet from the data sheet and what we can say here is the transition time and propagation delays of this they are quite different from these ships and with the 74 hct 32 we're speaking about transition times and propagation delay times of about 30 to 20 nanoseconds and if we see on the HHCT page they actually are at least twice as fast and sometimes they are three times as fast the propagation delay is is three times so fast and the other transition time is about twice as fast so the HCT is a much much faster components and it might resemblance the F series of LS logic or I might have to see in my parts bin to see if I can get some other faster chips because I did not order these ships I had them from before in my parts bin so I don't have any H HET parts so that is something I might have to look into and back to this again we can see that this is used for the clock and it's also used for the write and read on the control signals for the video circuits and here you can see how this is uh, coupled together you just have these labels here and you have the same label up on the ship here so there is no connected leads here it's just the labels that tie this together and that's fine as you learn how to read these kind of schematics but it's a bit confusing in the beginning and also here you have the PAL clock generator that uh, produces the PAL clock to this ship and all this is connected and measured out and this works just fine and here you can see it's the same parts for the, the ship select and this is the, the zone chip and it also controls the joysticks. This is used for the, the ship select part of things and this is probably not our culprit as this does not have anything to memory or the other bus. It, it does of course connect to the data bus and in some case to the address bus but nothing much to see there. And here you have the keyboard controller or the keyboard decoder chip. It's the 82C55. And this was one of the culprits that could give the out of memory not found message as one other forum user had um, stated. On this page we also have a lot of the other glue logic that Sergey has mentioned. We have this of course this HCT32s that's on every page. But we do have U40. And we do have U41, we have the U23, U22, U31 and U30 all are on this page. And here you can see where uh, Sergey mentioned that I have used HC logic to connect to other logic. Here I do have, and I did have a HC273 chip and here i did have a ls chip i have tried some swapping of these but this is the cage where i used the hc logic is this 273 i actually used it on the other 273 too but that is not critical for the functioning of the computer and here up you can see some more of this labeling this is the labeling that's used internal on these schematics and this is what it connects to on the other schematics and this probably is a source of confusion for um, at least it is for me but as i've learned to read this it, it's okay i managed to find my way around this but it can be a bit confusing at times and here there is no marked ICs and this is the slots, the, the cartridge slot. And this is the genius part of the MSX. You have these parallel slots, almost like an ISA slot on a PC. They only have this slot select and bus direction signal that is changed from one slot to another. And here they have used F logic for the speed probably. And you have this gall that ties together all this bus control logic. I will go into more details about the galls later because I will show you some confusion I had when I was burning this and using verify to, to test them. And this is the HC or HCT 670s. And Sergio stated that this is okay to use as HC 
he has at least done that in the schematics and that was a price issue i think uh, they are much much cheaper than the hct 670s and i don't have them in hct i do have them in hc and i do have them in 74 ls 670 and here you have u32 that's mentioned uh, on Sergey's part and you have the aforementioned HCT 32s and it's actually three of those H A H C T 32s in this uh, circuit and they're spread on almost every page and they they do some of the ship selects on read uh, and write signals on every page and this is the EEPROM that controls the BIOS and here you can see that internal on the memory circuits here, you don't use the data lines that comes in here. You do use the some buffered data lines that goes into the EEPROM and to the memory chip. And this is the memory chip that uh, no one can find, even though I can clearly see it's in the circuit. And I also can measure some signals on these buses from time to time. This is a static RAM chip, and now I have tested with several chips, and they all give the same result, so I can say that it's not the chip that is the culprit here. And you also have a RAM expansion slot that also paged and controlled by the same glue logic that handles the rest of the, the memory. And you can also see that you have these jumpers here, but these jumpers are hardwired on the bottom of the PCB, so I don't think they matter at all as long as there is no memory connected to this uh, socket here. And you also have the wire to change between the upper and higher part of the EPROM. This is a 512k EPROM and the BIOS uses 256k. So you can change between two images in this chip by this jumper here. And here you have some analog part of the circuit. You do have all the mappings for the capacitors, also the decouplings for all the ICs. And you have the sound input that mix together with these resistors and goes to the um, amplifier circuit here that gives you the audio out and you also have the cassette interface here that buffers the signal in and it also takes care of the output signals that goes to your tape recorder and there also is a relay here to control the uh, motor of the cassette player so this is fairly standard msx i think i do have a tape recorder for one of my other msx's and i do think it's the same plug on this board i do think we have used the same plug for um, the rgb so those must not be mixed up and last but not least of course is the um, schematics for the the cpu circuit and also the printer port circuit is on this page together with the clock circuit for the real-time clock and you also have the, the watchdog that keeps the reset pulled down and also controls the reset if you don't have battery and, and so on as we discovered in our first part when we, we powered this on. The printer circuit is of no concern to us. It's nothing here that writes back that can control the memory as far as I can see. You do have here a HC273 because I don't have the HCT part. I do have 74LS273s that I can use for this printer port, but I don't think it will matter. This circuit here, I have confirmed that it works. It gives the proper reset at startup. And this reset signals keeps the reset for all the chips that needs to be reset or wait for the CPU to start up before they start. And this circuit here is the real-time clock that gives out the timer signals to keep track of, um, of time of the day. And this crystal here, I have measured everything so I do know that this is, is working, this oscillator. And you have a GAL ship here, one of the GALs that controls a lot of the ship select and also some of the um, printer signals that I do think have two ship select. You have a printer command ship select and a printer data write, the signal that goes here. And this is the, the CMOS version of the Z80. And I do have a lot of these. 
and I have them with different vintages and different variants with regard to speed. But since this is running uh, sub 4 MHz, it's no problem with any of the chips that I have. And I actually uh, tried off camera to switch to another set 80 to see if there was something wrong with that, but that gave the same result as we did on the other one. You can also see here by these uh, schematics that the unused gates of the ships are connected to ground and that's very good practice because on a um, TTL circuit an open input is defined as a high so it can be sustainable to noise and other things that can make this work in the analog part of the input and output spectrum that means that this can have some port of a draw and it can also make some parasitic oscillation if you don't tie this to ground as you should. So this is good practice, even though in most cases you get away with not doing this. That was a short walkthrough of the, the schematics and we will now look into a bit of the functionality to the GAL ships that is uh, used here to simplify the glue logic. Before we start um, to go into depth on these um, gall ships, I'm going to um, show you what actually went wrong and what confused me at first with these ships. At first I selected the right ship and it was a bit of confusion between different versions of Otmel and VPP voltage and so on, but the values for auto detect and for uh, erase before and very few after we leave untouched. That is uh, the wise way to have it, I think. Encrypt chip is also also a standard value, I don't know really what that means on a gold ship. And before I do anything else, I will erase this chip so that we know that is totally blank. And you can see that erase succeeded with flying colors. To make a test, I will actually load up a GED file from uh, the MSX Omega project. And we can really choose any one of these files. I can take the, the slot select. It really doesn't matter. They're very small, all of them. And they contain about the same kind of, of data. They are used in a kind of ship select and combining logic way. I don't see any clock inputs or other thing that is used in, um, in this. Now with the, the file loaded, we will try to burn the contents of the GED file onto uh, the device. And as we saw here, we have the flash and the lock bit. They are set as standard. And when we hit program, it also does the erase program and verify as we stated in the earlier configuration. And you can see here both verify and programming was successful. But if you really want to make sure that you have done this, the most concerning of us we do another verify. And you can see here it went wrong. It says that it's some fuse bit and some other stuff that went wrong. And actually if you have bad goals, they will show the same. But this is a working ship. And the secret is in this lock bit. This lock bit has to be not burned to be able to read out the contents of the ship. So we try to burn again, same ship, same file, and the same settings except the lock bit. And you can see it programmed successful as it did last time. But now let's try a verify and see what uh, happens. And you can see the verify succeeded just fine and the lock bit is turned off. So this is actually the secret to do if you use old recycled goals, and you probably are because most of them are then this is a very wise way to do this to make sure that you don't get false mistakes on your hands. And speaking about recycled and rebadged ships from uh, China, it's also wise to notice that the VPP voltage of some of the ships from Lattice and others are 16 volts. And if you have used the Atmel setting and it doesn't work, it might be wise to try one of the other settings because it's not sure that this is an Atmel chip, even though it's a genuine chip. It can be another manufacturer and this you can step up in half volt increments so that you can try your way if your gall appears dead. Yeah, here we say what's wrong with static logic and I will say there is nothing wrong with static logic. I love tinkering with the logic chips. But when you have this kind of complexity, and this is from the original IBM 5150, 
and you have sheet upon sheet with complicated logic like this and that you are able to do most of this logic into one or two or three of these chips it's of course a huge space saver it's a cost saver and it's also easier to fix mistakes if you have done some errors in timing and so on on your circuit you can just reprogram a gal chip or PAL chip or PLA chip and make do with that. So I do fully understand the need and reason for doing this and actually back in the 80s I was experimenting with doing this with EEPROMs where I did several projects where I should do complex decoding, memory decoding and so on. I made it memory decoding for a complete 6502 system with only one single 8K EEPROM that had the chip decoding built into that and that meant that I actually had 14 inputs and I had the 8 data bits as outputs for what chip I should select. And the history of programmable logic goes way back and it's almost as old as the first what we call static logic that is the 74 series and 4000 series that is most known. And the first room ship actually was from 1965, even though the technology did not found out until the 70s when we have UV erasable airprooms from yeah, about 1970 and outwards. And these can do static memory that does not contain flip-flops and other complex things and they it's not very good on delays and other stuff too. It's just simple decoding. And the PLA is almost the same, but it does have some more means of doing delays and stuff. And this was replaced by the PAL chips that come some years later, from 1970 out and onwards. And the first versions of this was UV erasable. And they also have some chips that's not erasable at all. It's one time programmable as these ones. And this was replaced gradually with GAL chips and there is a lot of GAL chips that is compatible pin by pin by PAL chips and can be yeah replace whole circuits with this and this of course has all their use but this is obsolete technology and this is almost not being done at all today all the GALs are obsolete and went into production more than 10 years ago and they are replaced by CPLD and FPGA devices that does not only take into account the glue logic, but the FPGA, as we know it from the retro world, you have complete systems. You can take the, the whole Amiga and other things and all the ships, all the peripherals, everything and put it into one FPGA and FPGA actually stands for field programmable and that means that every thing you do in this is programmable and is normally programmable without replacing the ship in any way. Yeah and um, the CPLD and FPGA is living their life side by side and it's some difference in and how the logic is actually implemented and that's why they are living side by side. This is the natural successor to this simple programmable logic devices. And this is a complete matrix where you can do everything. And when I say everything, I, I mean everything. You can also do analog, you can do a signal processing, and you can do a lot of other things on the big FPGAs. In our circuit here, we are using the 16V8 family of GAL chips, and that's the, the small 20 pin ones. And they are arranged like this. And we are not going into detail how this is working, but actually you can see here that you have all these lines where you have made some connections here. And the logic here is that you actually can apply a connection in every one of the other matrices here. And a uh, gold ship can work in three different modes, simple mode, where you have fixed I.O., you have simple mode without tree state, and you have complex mode where you actually do have pins that you can use both to input and output, and you have registered mode where you can have both output enabled and a clock pin to toggle stuff inside the chip. 
So if you have something that you need to replace that actually contains a 7474 dflop, you have to use registered mode to replace that by a gal. And of course it has its limitations that you only have one of these toggles for each output, but you can of course loop back internally from one cell to another and use all eight of them. There are some other limitations and some other things too, but we're not going into them now. This is not a course in using GALS. It's just an overview of the family and what they do. And uh, just as a curiosity, this is the JED files that is supplied to the Omega to make the, the three different chips. And you have the slot select that actually selects what should be decoded into what slot. And when we're thinking slots here, it's actually the bank switching of the CPU to make the CPU address more than the 64K that the set 80 normally can address. And you have the ship select that select the ships within the normal scope of each slot. And you have slot direction. And this is actually if the slots should be read only, if they should be um, cartridge, if they should be RAM and so on. And there also is some other logic built into this that I have not yeah, gone into the depth of finding out. But this was as far we are going to look into the gall ships and all the galls are working and i have verified them in um, two ways so i do know that they are working so this is the last we are going to look into the galls if there is no fix that is suggested to us about making some changes to the programming of the the gall ships but now over to what you all have been waiting for, and that is what have I actually done on this board since last time? And that is, yeah, it's, it's something, but it's not all, of course, because I have not been able to get this to work. I should, of course, have said spoiler alert first, but these ships here, these ships here are the F series of logic, and I have done nothing with them except changing one of them that was acting a bit suspect and i actually had uh, and what you can see on, on this picture i have two different versions of this 20 um, 255 chip and they don't actually behave the same because when i test them in the chip tester uh, not the retro chip tester but the epron programmer they actually have slightly different truth table so I changed both of them with uh, something that tests for a 245. And, and this other test also identified this as a 245, but it also identified it at a 645. And I have not been able to look up that. So I have changed one of these. I left all the, um, the other behind. And the F logic is the faster kind of TTL logic. It's faster than LS. As you can see, the F is a much faster ship than the LS, and even at the maximum propagation delays and rise and, and fall times of the F ship, it's magnitude so faster than the LS. So if you need a short propagation delay or short raise and fall time, you use the F series. This is the 670 ships, and that was stated from Sergey that he thought that the HC kind uh, was probably okay. But I also have tried this with LS chips with um, the same result, and I have tried with another CPU, and that I actually have tried before. I have a lot of these set 84 c 6 CPUs. And I have them some, some called 6, some called 4, some called 8, and so on. And that is just um, the speed they are tackling. And they should be pin compatible. And I have not seen any change regarding these ships. I have tried to change this main ship. That was actually just to try, not to try uh, to get the board working. It was actually to try because I did find another one of these ships. And I do think this is a ship I ordered on AliExpress when I ordered these boards because I didn't think I was having that ship. But of course I did have it uh, anyway. But my other ship of these was bad, so I put the original one back. 
I have gone in and reprogrammed the gulls, not because I did think it was anything wrong with them, but this was when I noticed that if I try to verify them, I get something wrong. So I went into this uh, frenzy where I, I tried every Otsmel I had and they was acting all the same. I tried some other brand and they was acting slightly different. And in the end, my brother tipped me that you had to take away this uh, lock flag to be able to do verify. I have tried without this ship here. This is the sound ship and also controls some joystick and some other things. I don't know if it has any other function that would make the BIOS or something else detect this otherwise, but it didn't make any difference, so I just put it back in. And I don't have any replacement chip for these, I think. I may have a tube somewhere, I have to check that out. And this ship up here, this is the HC273 that uh, Sergey was noticing that I was using. And I actually have one more uh, HC273 down here that was in the circuit when he noticed this. And this one uh, up here, the, the printer one. It does not matter at all, because this is not doing anything else than managing the printer. But this HCT273, I didn't have any HCT, but I tried it with um, LS and ALS, I think. And it did not change anything. I also tried another branch with HC, same result. That was when I was thinking... Okay, if this is an issue with, with the LS contra HCT or some other driving error, why just not change out everything else and make them, um, yeah, just change everything that it's HCT with, um, with LS? I started doing that. This one is the clock ship. It does not matter much because it's a buffered output and it's easy to see if it doesn't work. But I changed everything here for um, LS and I did change them in batches. So I, I changed one and one type of chip and actually tested this between each change. And of course it did not do any different. Otherwise I of course would have stopped playing around when I get everything to work. So at this point I had changed out everything in this circuit with, uh, with LS. And I took the plunge and I did that with this one that already was LS and I also did it with, with this one. And I also in fact changed these to, um, to LS. I burnt several new EPROMs. I think I have burnt four EPROMs with different versions and stuff of the, the BIOS. And I have tried eight different memory chips. I bought actually two new ones with different designations from the one I had. And I had six uh, lying around. Two that I have used before in, in a Sergey project. And I had four others. And every one of these tests out okay in the Mini Pro programmer. When I tweaked it to measure this as a generic static memory. But that is not a test that I do rely on. So where does this uh, put us? There is one ship here. Uh, oh, there is more ships that I haven't marked. These up here are um, just um, op amps. They are not doing anything logically. This one is a special Sony ship. I don't have any more of these. I don't think it matter in this regard but of course every stone needs to be turned but this is video decoding rgb and so on so i don't think it matters you have the the clock ship that's down here that does probably not matter i do have a replacement i think i can try to change it it actually interferes with the data bus and i do have the reset watchdog timer chip down here i don't have any replacement for that but i do think it does what it should so that's probably okay but after i had done all of this i was concerned about something and that i did state in the um, introduction and that is that uh, these ships here that should be the hct 32s in the manual these ships they are described as h T. And that is regarding all of these. And that is the HCT version of the F chip. Uh, and it's also comparable to some other faster series 
for the LS, but I don't have any 74 F32s and I don't have any HCT. And that is something that needs to be checked out. And that is actually what I'm working now to get some faster chips into um, all of these three sockets here. And there is one more thing that I'm working on. And that was also said in the introduction. And that is this one here. The 82C55. And I don't have any more 82C55s. I do have a couple of 8255s. And when I have changed all this to um, LS logic, I did try another one of these and it did not work. It can be other stuff, of course. I still have a CMOS version of the CPU. It might not be able to drive this. So there could be other things. But I will first, before I, I continue with this, I will make sure that I have the, the proper chips in place. So I will try to change out these 32s with a, a faster version in case that's the, the culprit. And they are used as chip select on a lot of chips. And chip select needs to be speedy because the chips needs to be selected when the other signals arrive. So that's not um, that's not where you want things to to drag out uh, and slug along. And I have also got some other capacitors where we just put in some uh, temporary fixes before. So here I actually got the variable capacitors, but I don't think that the fault lies there. So that's why I have not changed them um, them yet. Yeah, I just had to add this in the explanation because I do think that I, I have breached into the team of the speeds of the different logic families in different chips, but I don't think I have explained this good enough. So that's why I do this uh, break and try to take this again. And now we are only looking at one of the speed parameters of a logic chip, and that's the propagation delay and that's the delay from something happens on the um, the input like it does does here and the delay to have the expected output and what we have measured here is the low to high so it fits with this graph and we have taken all the different logic series that is in normal use and some that is not in in normal use today is mostly LS and it's F and it's HGT. That's the, the normal ships today. And why we are looking into this is that we actually is advised to use the AHCT for the um, 7432s in this design. And what we see here is that you have a delay and this is measured from the input reaches 1.5 volt. And on a CMOS series of ship, and that's the HC, HCT, and AHCT, it measured at the output gives out 50% of VCC, and with 5 volt, that's actually 2.5 volt, and with 4.45 volt, that this is um, given in the data sheet. It will be slightly lower, of course, 2.25 volt. But on the other chips, it's measured to the output reaches 1.5 volt and goes above. So there might be some slight disadvantages uh, in the um, HCT because it reaches a higher uh, voltage before this is measured. So that means that the HCT chips are probably even faster than what we have shown here. But to make sure what we actually have done at this time, we have put in an LS ship, and an LS ship means that we are in this area with the typical delay, and in this area with the maximum delay. And an HCT, what is advised, is in this area. If we have used the F, we will have been in this area. And if we have used what was in the design now originally, we had HCT32s and they are in this area. So 
the HCT and the LS is not much difference and all the other chips are much faster than this. So that might mean that some of our timings when we select chips are off. And remember what I said, the chip selects are the most important timings to get right because you need to make sure that an input is enabled and the output of another chip is enabled so they should be able to communicate at the same time. If you have an output enable or ship enable that is not active when the signal changes, you miss the opportunity. And that is why I do think that the 74HCT will be the solution to this problem. Because I have not gone into a, a changing frenzy just to change chips. I actually tried the LS just as a as a thing because in a lot of the new designs they use HCT and that's that's good because of the power consumption but a lot of people like me I have a lot of LS chips from back in the day and I know people that has designed this Omega with just LS chips so I wanted to try that out so I only back with with two culprits and I do think they're partly responsible each of them and that is that I need to change the 7432s to faster chips so that I will be able to reach about this area somewhat when it comes to speed or that might not be the right because that was the, the maximum so if I say that I will reach yeah about this level of, of speed with the changing to uh, F's or HTTs in this position I think the solution to our problems lie there but it's also the 82C55 and I don't know why this does not work I have actually tried it now in a PC and on old XT and there the CMOS version of this ship actually works so I do know that the 82C55 actually do work but it might be some timing issue or some other things that does this to our circuit. You always have two other delays on uh, a ship like this. What is the rise time and what is the fall time of an uh, output signal? So this is not something you have to think about when you do just a couple of hundred and hertz, but when you do megahertz, then this is an issue that you need to take into consideration. And there is also these large differences between the typical time and the maximum time. And that largely depends on the load uh, normally, because you, if you have a capacitive load, this will typically be a longer delay time. If you have some suggestions for other things that can actually make this happen, please notify me because I'm starting to run out of uh, IDs. I do know, in fact, that most of these ships are working and I have not seen as of yet any bus conflicts or other stuff on this uh, board. So it appears that the signal paths and so on are okay. But of course, these uh, 74... 32s, if they are too slow to select things, that's something I might not have noticed on the scope. But that is something I can check for. I can check with more signals on the scope at once and check the edges of stuff to see when things switch and if there are some noise when they are switching. So that's what I have been doing so far on this board. And also, no, I'm waiting for 82 C55s to arrive from uh, China. I am waiting for HCT 273s. I am waiting for F32s and also AHCT 32 chips to, um, to test them out. And I don't know when they will arrive, but I do think they will arrive rather shortly. The Chinese New Year is over and... I actually got the package that I ordered just two weeks ago. I, I got this Friday, so there might be some hope that I do get this within a week or two. So, thanks for watching. This was all for uh, this rather long and winding episode. If I don't get the parts, I will start another uh, project to have something to work on while I wait for uh, parts. Please like and subscribe. 
please watch some of my uh, older uh, videos I want this channel to grow a bit so that I can um, get into this mysterious partnership status so thank you for watching hope to see you in my next video